Hello and welcome to this Oak Tree English video on language devices. Today we're going to figure out how writers put things into your mind. So I've made a little bit of a joke here. I put language devices on a device being held by the flag, which is a symbol of the British language, the English language. <laughs> Ah, oh, oh, I'm so funny. Um, I apologise, I'm not funny at all. Normally we talk about Da Forest when we're talking about literary language devices. And I usually uh, make the same joke. You can't see Da Forest for Da Trees. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Uh, OK, you're not laughing, so I'm going to move on. Today we're going to put it, organise them slightly differently. We're going to organise these things into four categories. Um, and it's going to be, I'm going to give you the clip notes. <laughs> so that's right. The linguistic devices I refer to are organized into content. Now, this is the content, um, the, the, the area that is, is the, uh, the content of the, of the text. We're going to have language. We're going to have imagery. And we're going to have pronunciation, C-L-I-P, clip, content, language, imagery, 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 <laughs> and pronunciation. Uh, pronunciation didn't quite work there, did it? Let's have a quick look at what these might mean. So content. Content is what is actually said by the characters or by the narrator or by in, in the text. So this comes under various things, notably, irony so for example in the wizard of oz uh, dorothy travels to see a wizard to get home only to find she had the power to do so on her own all the time and the other qualities they the other the characters asking for character qualities like courage or brain and it turns out they had the courage and the brains in the first place so it's all right uh another content one is foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is uh, where you tell something at the beginning of a story that comes into effect later on. So, for example, uh, at the beginning of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry Potter speaks to a snake who then slithers out through the uh, through the through the zoo, um, terrorizing his cousin Dudley in the process. Um, but the late, later on, we get the revelation that parcel he that Harry is a parcel mouth and he's speaking a language called parcel tongue. And this is a very rare gift in the wizarding world. And it becomes a very important part of the plot. That is foreshadowing. So another one is anecdotes. So anecdotes are little short stories that people tell. And you get this all the time in things like Huckleberry Finn. Um, think about it for, if you have read it, Oscar Wilde, um, The Remarkable Rocket. Oscar, Oscar Wilde, as well as writing The Ballad of Reading Jail, which is my, my boss's favourite poem, um, he also wrote The Happy Prince and Other Tales. Uh, this, and within this was a, um, a, a story called The Remarkable Rocket. Well, this is a story which focuses on talking fireworks. Un unlikely scenario, but you know, let's let's bear with it. Um, and one of these is uh, a rocket, and the rocket likes to be likes to tell how how incredibly incredible he is. He talks about his heritage and his and sensitivity in, a, in an effort to get the other fireworks to see him in in a particular way. Unfortunately, his bragging and anecdotal stories don't get him very far as he ends up wet in a ditch. But that's 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 another. Uh, I don't want to ruin the story for you. Um, if you think of Uncle Colm from The Derry Girls, uh, who is said to be one of the most boring people who ever lived, uh, but he is constantly telling anecdotes. Constantly telling anecdotes. Little stories. So, language. How do people use language in order to um, create a certain 
impression in your mind. Well, let's think about that. They use things like hyperbole. Now, this here is the best example in the history of the world. No, it isn't. Um, hyperbole is where you overinflate something, you exaggerate something to such an extent that it's ridiculous. And it's, that is hyperbole. Then there's repetition and also repetition. See what I did there. So think of the, the opening lines of Man and Boy by Tony Parsons. It's a boy. It's a boy. It's a little boy. Really emphasising this uh, this sense of excitement. Um, we've got Juxtaposition, which is a song from the 1990s. Juxtaposed, I'm juxtaposed. Um, however, it's also uh, a, a feature where you've got two ideas sort of putting each other into intention by being side by side. So think of uh, Dylan Thomas, um, the poem he wrote to his father when he found out his father was going blind. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old, uh, old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Got this juxtaposition of um, of the way things should be and the way things are and the way things aren't actually happening um, for him. But he's got this juxtaposition position holding these things in tension. Then we've got direct address, of course, the D of Da Forest. Um, think of Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte's book, Jane Eyre. She's constantly speaking in the first person as if directly addressing the reader. You see this in first person or second person. What do you think about that? This is direct address. We also have oxymoron, um, which is what some people call me when they're, they're in a bad mood with me. However, think of, this is where you've got two, uh, two, two contradictory ideas next to each other um, and yet somehow making sense. So, for example, from Romeo and Juliet, here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh, brawling love, O oh, loving hate, O oh, anything of nothing first create, O oh, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos, chaos of well-seeming forms. OK, I admit I don't do as well, that as well as Leonardo DiCaprio, but I'm also paid a lot less than Leonardo DiCaprio. So, you know, cut me, cut me some slack. <laughs> Our third um, area in our clip notes is imagery. There's lots of different forms of Im imagery which we're going to talk about. First one I'm going to mention is a simile. So a simile is where you've got a direct comparison. So you've got, uh, I, I, I love the example in Terry Pratchett's Masquerade, opening lines of, uh, of Masquerade. Lightning prodded the crags like an old man trying to get an elusive blackberry pip out of his false teeth. <laughs> you, you can sort of feel it, can't you? It's like, ah, ah, ah. Um, but it's a direct comparison. It's like, like or as are the keys to a, to a good simile. Similar to a simile is a metaphor. You knew what was coming. So think about Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. I'm sure you know it. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveller long I stood. The last verse of that makes it very plain what uh, what he's actually writing. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less travelled by. And that has made all the difference. Um, so we've got this. This is a metaphor for any decision. Any decision you've ever made has been like two roads parting, except not like, like here. He's saying it is two roads parting. A subset of that is personification. Uh, here I'm going bang up to date. Well, you know, 1960s um, with uh, with an example from the Beatles. This is personification is where you give inanimate objects human char characteristics so for example the Beatles song while my guitar gently weeps is a personification because a guitar cannot weep it cannot cry it does not have tear ducts 
it is unable to do such a thing. However, um, McCartney, I think it was McCartney who wrote that one, uh, says here that he's um, that the his guitar is expressing this emotion of sadness. It's, it's, it's really quite clever. Um, I think a subset of that, so we've got a subset of metaphor. Metaphor is a subset of imagery, which is a subset of, personification is a subset of metaphor. So a subset of personification would be the pathetic fallacy. <laughs> so this is where you're attributing human emotions to inanimate natural things, such as, and often, the weather. For example, uh, you're all familiar with Wordsworth, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, hosts of golden daffodils. Um, lone, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Clouds are not lonely. Clouds do not have the capacity for loneliness since they are not actually emotional beings. And therefore, the pathetic fallacy is, is being employed here. Finally, within imagery, I'm going to talk about allegory. So allegory is where you're uh, is where you're saying one thing is is another thing. So it's similar to metaphor here, but it's perhaps a bit larger. So within a story. So for example, think of uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which if you haven't read, you really must because it'll change your life. Uh, this is where the main protagonist, Christian, makes his way from the city of destruction to the celestial city. Encountering all sorts of trials along the way, like the slough of despond and the giant despair. Um, each of these is uh, each of these are examples of allegory, and the story itself is an allegory of the Christian life, um, and it's it's extraordinarily well done. Particularly given that he was put in, he was in prison for uh, preaching Christianity. Uh, I'll let you do your study on church history for that one. So the fourth and final suggestion I have in our clip notes is pronunciation. So we have a, a list of things here that are pronunciation features. Here we go. Let's have a let's start off with rhyme. So most poems you read will rhyme, but also we have we have fairly common phrases in the English language. See you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. Hey, don't, don't judge me. Mate. I'm too cool for school. Um, this video is make or break, you know. Each of these is, a, is rhyming. It creates this, uh, it makes the text catchy. It creates a sort of bonhomie with the, with the reader. And that's what, the, that, that's how that can be, can be used. Alliteration is the other end. It's where you've got two words that begin with the same sound. Rhyming ends with the same sound. Uh, be and alliteration begins with the same sound. So think about rocky road. It's a rocky road to get there. Big business, kissing cousins, same sound. Notice not necessarily the same letter. Think this is something that um, always happens in comic books. Think of Lois Lane, Clark Kent, Peter Parker, Wonder Woman. A subset of alliteration would be sibilance. This is where you've got a, a, a line of s sounds, fricatives, in uh, in a um, in a line. So think about from uh, the Lady of Shalott, where Tennyson's describing the the boats on the river, and he says, "The shallop flitteth silken sailed." Try it again. The shallop flitteth silken sailed. You've got the sh, f, s, s. Um, you've got f, a, 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 oh, and f, sorry, excuse me, flitteth. Um, so you've got one, two, three, four, five fricatives all in a row. The shallop flitteth silken sailed. <laughs> fricatives are where you are expelling air, and it can be f or v or f or th, or ch, or sh, or s. Okay, um, let's have a look at onomatopoeia. Now, of course, you all know, you all know that onomatopoeia means 
a, a word that sounds like the sound it's describing. Bang! Fizz! Uh, woo! Yeah. Um, if the, this is a difficult word to spell, I would just like to say that when I spelt this, I got it right first time. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. I can see you're impressed. I can't because this is a video. I, I can't actually see you at the moment, but I'm sure you are impressed. You, you, in my mind's eye, you are impressed. If you are going to find onomatopoeia difficult to spell in the exam, choose another example. Choose another technique to uh, to identify because it, yeah, it, it's, it's not worth getting getting the mark only to lose a mark on spelling. Onomatopoeia. You all know the musical um, My Fair Lady with the song I'm getting married in the morning a ding dong the bells are gonna chime ding dong is on a matter here to be fair, fair so is chime chime you may if you're not familiar with that one and you want a bit of prose then there's a book called the marvelous toy by tom paxton and that has has a lovely line in it it went zip when it moved and bop when it stopped and whirr when it stood still. You can hear the sounds, can you? Zip, bop, whirr. So these are pronunciation features. So I hope that this helps you to, uh, to understand and identify those language features. You can now go and use those yourself or you can just write them down in an exam, pass the exam and give me the credit. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye. I've disappeared. So now you can't see me, but you can hear my voice as the cloud moves across the sun, putting rain on and grub grows the tree. And that's a metaphor in itself. Ah, have a great day. Goodbye.